We're talking this afternoon with Clive Lawton, who is a co-founder of Limud, and we would like to ask Clive about the origins of Limud, and what it's done up until now, and how it's expanded up until today, and where he sees it going in the future. Well, Limud started decades ago. It started in 1980. There were four of us. Um, the prospect of living forever in the desperately dull, boring, smug, rather ignorant Jewish community of England uh, was just too depressing. And so uh, four of us got together and felt that uh, it would be good to learn from the huge variety of people we knew, new stuff, and yet didn't know each other and didn't have an opportunity to share what they knew. So uh, Limud was born. About uh, 70 people came to that first one in 1980. Uh, and it's grown and grown ever since. Where was it? Uh, well, we held it in a Jewish boarding school back then called Carmel College in the English countryside. Uh, but as it's grown, it's gone from uh, college to university to bigger sites. Now, Limud in the UK, the Limud Conference, which is a five-day residential event uh, in December, not Holomoid Christmas, you know, between Christmas and New Year, um, it's, uh, it attracts about 2,500 people. Uh, there are about a thousand sessions with about 400 presenters from all around the world and it's, it's vast, it's the biggest of all the Limuds in the world. Um, in about 1998 or 97, 98, a bunch of Australians came from Sydney. Um, they came to Limud and they left with the determination to create a Limud in Sydney. And that was the very first Limud outside of the UK. Uh, but it certainly wasn't the last. There are now about 60 in the world. Um, I've just been to the first Limud China. A couple of weeks before I was with the Philadelphia team. In a couple of weeks time I'm going to be with the Hungary team. Um, we're in Turkey, in South Africa. I've just been down to New Zealand to work with the team in Auckland. Um, five places in Israel, including Jerusalem. Eight or nine sites in the United States and Canada right around Europe. Uh, it, it really is spreading like a rash all over the planet. Um, and uh, Sydney really was the first place to think about we could make this model travel. Um, and that of course made us think about well if it can travel to Sydney why don't we see where else it might go. And so other overseas people who came to the Limwood Conference in Britain we said to them well have you thought about this in Holland? Or what about this in the Galil? Have you tried this in New York? And so it spread. Nationalisation of uh, Limudars, has it given birth to many topics which are discussed in one country that's never considered that other country before? So in other words, could it, would, it be, would it be feasible that Australian topics may be discussed in, in other countries? It's feasible that an Australian presenter might go to another country and talk about something that concerns him or her, and that may be Australian. There is a growing um, interplay between you know, well-known and successful presenters at different Limuds, and presenters tend to become Limud groupies and uh, go wherever they're asked. And of course, it, it's important to note that one of the principles of Limud is nobody gets paid. Uh, so presenters are also participants, they're also just contributing what they have to offer uh, along with everybody else. Um, so I could well imagine that. I haven't yet seen another Limud entirely preoccupied with the concerns of Australia jury. Um, but what does happen is that certain issues which are in fact universal but are only being discussed in one place, um, people see it being explored in that place and then go back to their own Limud group and go, well, if they talked about it, why can't we? And a very good example of that, I suppose, is the a really challenging issue for many Jews of homosexuality and what its place is in the Jewish world and how the Jewish world can, does, accommodate gay and homosexual folk. Um, some communities have not really started to get their heads around it, but seeing that it could be discussed at Limud is one of the things then that enabled people to discuss it. In this day and age of um, growing assimilation, a phenomenon which isn't actually new within, within Jewish culture, it's, uh, it, it just rears its head from time to time through the centuries. Do you see Limud as a tool to, to counter assimilation? I don't want Limud to be a tool for anything. I think Limud is an opportunity for people to learn. What they do with their learning is really no knowing. 
Uh, you know, one of our slogans is uh, Limud undertakes to help you take one step further on your own Jewish journey. So we don't know what your Jewish journey is, we don't know what the next step is, but we're going to try and give you as many opportunities to find your next step. Uh, I personally hope, uh, I guess mostly what Nick's would hope, that that next step isn't out. Um, but but what that step is, is, is impossible to say. And one person may be Jewishly passionate because of their interest in the Hebrew language, and another person may be Jewishly passionate because of their commitment to performing mitzvot. And, and who's to say whether one or another should take this step or that step next? So I, I don't want Limud to be a tool. What, what I do know, though, is that it tends to be, um, the, the effect of Limud tends to be that most Jews do get Judaically more engaged. That doesn't mean they may get more involved. Because some people may look at the community in which they live and go, I don't want to have anything to do with those folk. They're, they're, they're boring, they're dull, maybe they don't like me, they don't want me in there. Um, but most people get Jewishly more involved, some, more engaged um, in, in their own way. Um, so no, I don't want it to be a tool. By the way, this thing about assimilation, you know, if you walk around as I do with a kippah, it's kind of a Jew magnet. And wherever you go, people come up to you and say, oh, you're Jewish, you know, I'm Jewish too, or whatever it may be. And you can go to the strangest little villages here and there in the middle of nowhere in Britain. And somebody will sidle up to you and go, I can see you're a Jew. Well, you know, my uncle, he's a Jew. And what you discover is that people were marrying out all over the place, all through history. And the only thing is that in the old days, they had the decency to go and hide and we'd sit shit before them and forget all about the fact they ever existed. Nowadays, you know, my goodness, people insist on being noticed and they continue to talk to us and stuff. So now we've got to actually take on board that people are marrying non-Jews. And we've got to figure out how we respond to that. We've not been very good at figuring out how to respond to it yet. Uh, mostly, it's rather ostrich-like. Um, but uh, I, I don't think this assimilation thing is a new thing. And actually, I think, as far as I can see, an awful lot of Jews are, in fact, becoming more intelligently engaged in their Judaism than they were, you know, uh, a few decades ago. Well, that, that brings me to my next question, which uh, also brings me to discussing Limud in the, in the, in the future. Is Limud contagious. Do you find that people who have been to it schlep their friends and family? <laughs> yes. Into Limud? Yes, it's really dangerous actually. Um, almost cultish in its passion. Um, it, it, it is very contagious. Um, I think because it's so involving and also because in a way it's so permissive. Um, Limud doesn't tell you what it is you're supposed to learn. It just says for goodness sake learn something. And most Jews are intelligent, thoughtful folk. And they and, and given the opportunity to learn without somebody telling them, and you know what this means, it means you've got to something. It just says, you know, there's all this Jewish stuff out there. You, know, you want to watch a film, you want to listen to a comedian, you want to have a lecture, you want to be in a discussion, you want to play some music, you know, just do it. It's all Jewish stuff. And it all comes into a single place. There's always choice. So that's a critical Limud principle, right? There's always choice. So nobody's telling you, you've got to hear this guy. There's never a keynote lecturer, somebody who's so important that everybody's got to hear, right? So even if you've got somebody so important, we'd always put something else on in case people don't want to hear that guy. They've heard him already or they're not interested in what he has to say. So Limud is not going to tell you what you must know, but it really is committed to Jews learning. Um, and I'm much more committed to that, by the way, than Jews teaching. I mean, the, the presenters get a much lower profile than the learners. The power lies with the learner. Um, so I think that's very exciting and liberating and empowering. Add to that its volunteer nature, the fact that folk make it. This isn't some institution forcing it upon us. Um, it's done by folk like us. The programme is made up by folk like us. All right? and, and if the programme's not to your liking, then join the programming team next time and make sure that there are things on the programme that suit you. Right? So that capacity to get into Limud and get your hands on the levers of power within about 20 minutes of getting involved is a million miles from folk who join organisations and have to stuff envelopes for about 10 years before they get anywhere near where decisions are made. Um, so I think all of that really does turn people on. And one of the things we've discovered is that not only do we get the usual suspects, you know, the folks who are already very busy with Jewish stuff, get involved in Limud as well, but we also attract folk who've never found a place in the Jewish world. Uh, and this seems to speak to them. This seems to give them a sense that they could indeed engage at last. Is, 
this is a, an online limit. I mean, they, people come to the one in Sydney was one day, two days in Melbourne, and there's nothing now for a year. Although, the, although places like Shalom Institute here will run courses, but do you see limit actually putting itself as almost like an open uh, university for, for Jewish affairs? Well, first of all, Limud Oz here in Sydney has um, Limud Fest coming up in November. Shouldn't be forgotten about. Uh, that's a really lovely event out in the countryside. Um, and people should look out for Limwood Fest, so they don't have to wait that long for it. And then next June, uh, next Queen's Birthday weekend, uh, Limwood Sydney will run its two-day event. So already in Sydney, Limwood Oz is doing quite a variety of things, like the day we had uh, just recently. Um, and similarly in Melbourne, there's, there's their couple of days, and they also have a Limwood Fest alternate years in, in the summertime. And then there's Limwood... New Zealand. So if folk really want to go there, they can go there. Not to mention Limud China, and there's guys in Hong Kong talking about Limud there, and all over the world. Um, would we be online? You know, certainly quite a number of Limud sessions have been put up on various different sort of youtube type things. Um, and we do have a, 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 a Cedra commentary uh, every week uh, called Limud on One Leg. Uh, which puts out a couple of voices on the portion of the Torah that week. Um, and that's quite limudy because, although you only get the one, as it were, so there's no choice as far as that's concerned, the range of commentators through the course of the year probably only limud could pull together. They come from all over the world, they're of all kinds of backgrounds, all sorts of voices, sceptical, committed, questioning, unquestioning, um, poetic, intellectual, all sorts of responses. So over the course of a year, you accumulate an incredible number of voices and attitudes on the Torah. Um, but setting that aside, one of the most important things about Limud is the encounter. Um, if you like, not the sessions, but what I call the corridor sessions, you know, the conversation in the queue. Um, and that would be lost by just putting up a bunch of presentations. So. Uh, people think we're a bit like um, Ted, if you've come across that on, on the web, you know, this uh, collection of, of uh, great presentations. Uh, and people have imitated that a bit at Limud. But I think that it would be a shame to concede too much to the virtual world, because I think what we want is people to get into a place and meet each other and, and, and grow in the encounter. We've been talking this afternoon with Clyde Lawton, co-founder of Limud. And we thank you very much for your time with JY. Thank, thank you. you.